everybody. Um, as you can see, I am doing my first whole video in, I think, well over a month at this point. But um, what are you going to do? I mean, that's kind of my, my trademark at this point is uh, having a uh, upload schedule that's about as consistent as, like, contrapoints with none of the production quality. So um, in any case... I wanted to go over this clip of a debate that um, Yaron Brook, who's like an Ayn Rand Institute uh, objectivist libertarian type, um, who's debating David Pakman, who's obviously a prominent liberal social democratic uh, commentator. Um, and to sort of set this up, um, prior to the clip that I'm about to uh, play, David Pakman essentially made the argument that he doesn't have a problem with like the core mechanisms of capitalism. He doesn't think it's immoral that um, people make profit off of surplus value or anything like that. His problem is that given how much we are able to produce, there should not still be uh, uh, like poverty. That we could very easily redistribute our existing resources in such a way that we could eliminate poverty in this country. Um, and the fact that we haven't done that um, to David Pakman is a great injustice. Um, Yaron Brook now is going to essentially make the case that, um, look, we should try to eliminate poverty, but the way to do that isn't through government or redistribution. It's through just sort of letting the free market um, take its course. So let's uh, watch Yaron uh, Brook try to support this claim and then go over some data. But 8 billion people, 30 years ago, yep. 30 years ago. About 30% of the world population lived on $2 a day or less. According to the I United knew States you were going to do this. I knew you were going to do this, but I'll let this, you do it. Yeah. This, this is fact. Okay. Right? Using fact. Right? Today, that number is 8%. And if you look at where that decline has happened, where people have exited extreme poverty, yep. it's in places like China and India and, and much of Southeast Asia, yes. places that have adopted elements, a little bit, not nowhere near as much as I would like, elements, little bits of capitalism. And the middle class in those countries has, has grown by hundreds of millions of people, which suggests to me there's tons of wealth to be created. And I, I expect the same thing to happen in Africa. I, one of the things that, that I believe is so tragic is that a lot of the policies that I find on the left in, well, we don't want to use left. I find yeah, you on, said we weren't using those terms. Yes, I don't <laughs> like those terms. They would find on the, on the democratic socialist side, it would, would actually prohibit Africa from becoming middle class, which I think is, is unbelievably tragic. But I believe that hundreds of millions, every human being on the planet should be and could be living at the standard of living of an American middle class family if we adopted capitalism. And I don't consider social democrats capitalist. Why not? You know, it's all mixed economies. The elements of capitalism, elements of socialism, and we, we, we shuffle around the mixture. I want capitalism. You know, so, so when I talk about capitalism, I talk about the pure form of capitalism. If we actually adopted that, Billions of people would, right, would, 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 they've already escaped poverty, would now escape being poor at all and become middle class. So I think that that... Okay, so I think we get the gist. So there's a couple of facets to this argument. Um, essentially what Yaron Brook is saying, if I could try to uh, steel man it, as the cool IDW kids say, um, is that over time um, we've seen a massive reduction in poverty. And this reduction in poverty has coincided with the introduction of capitalism. And furthermore, um, places with more unfettered free market capitalism um, and less government intervention, less government social spending, tend to, be, uh, tend to have lower levels of poverty and tend to be the places where poverty has been eliminated more so. And therefore, um, the way, if we view eliminating poverty as desirable, the best thing that we can do is to sort of limit the scope of government, completely take it out of the realm of economics, and just let the free market run its course, and it will completely eliminate poverty. So the problem with Yaron Brook's uh, argument here is that it's essentially just completely factually incorrect at every level. So let's start with the historical claim. Um, so this is from um, Our World in Data. Uh, this article is called 
historical poverty reductions more than a story about free market capitalism. And essentially, um, this article makes the point uh, based on available data that we have that, and I quote, Yes, over the last two centuries, free markets and globalization have had a positive effect on uh, aggregate economic growth, contributing to better living conditions and the reduction of extreme poverty across the world. Yet this is far from the only important socioeconomic change, and moreover, uh, the last two centuries have not been all about free market capitalism. Governments around the world have dramatically increased their potential to collect revenues in order to redistribute resources through social transfers and raise the uh, living standards of those that are worst off. And then, as they put it uh, uh, later on, um, it is true that the historical reduction of extreme poverty around the world happened as markets liberalized and capitalism flourished. But it is also true that this reduction in poverty and improvement of living conditions happened at the time that public spending and redistribution to the worst off reached by far uh, uh, the highest levels ever. And then they have uh, graphs down here illustrating that. Um, Essentially, over time, as this is sort of in direct correlation with uh, as the timeline as far as when we've seen poverty uh, decline, um, governments have massively increased uh, their levels of government spending and public, sp uh, public social spending as a share of GDP over time. So the point here is that while Joran Brook wants to make the case that the reduction of poverty has coincided with the introduction of capitalism as an argument that unfettered capitalism and not public social spending is the cure for poverty. He ignores the historical fact that the reduction in poverty has not only coincided with the introduction of capitalism, but has also coincided with massive increases in public social spending by governments. So it's not just unfettered capitalism that's reduced poverty. It's actually the welfare and the public spending that he is saying uh, is an impediment to reducing poverty. And this is historical fact. Um, another data point that we can look at with regards to um, his claims that um, poverty, uh, uh, welfare isn't a, a valid way to reduce poverty and that... Um, the best way to reduce poverty is to just let the uh, free market run its course, is here we can see, um, this is a chart uh, from the U.S. Um, so this is um, persons in poverty based on market income and disposable income. Um, this is from a Matt Brunig article called um, The Welfare State is a Poverty Killing Machine. That's uh, at least where I got this graph from. Um, and essentially the point is, if you look at the amount uh, of people who are in poverty in terms of just their market income before you factor in the welfare that they receive, the number of people in poverty is about 77.9%. Um, and then when you look at the number of people uh, in poverty in terms of their disposable income after you factor in um, all of the welfare programs that they are receiving, the number of people in poverty is 42.4%. In other words, um, looking at how many people are in poverty before and after we take welfare into account, we can see that welfare programs just in the U.S. Um, have reduced poverty uh, by approximately 46%. Um, that is a massive reduction in poverty, um, completely as a product of the stringent, uh, not stringent, but uh, sort of tepid welfare policies that we have in the U.S. Um, additionally, to sort of make the point that uh, welfare, in a sort of international sense now can be seen as something which does effectively reduce poverty. Um, let's look at some graphs here. Um, this is based on uh, OECD country uh, statistics. Here we see that um, the poverty rate before taxes and transfers among different countries um, is pretty high. 
Um, and the United States is actually on the lower end before you take into account um, taxes and transfers. The United States is essentially on the lower end of, of uh, countries' uh, poverty rates. Um, however, after you take into account taxes and transfers, the United States shoots to essentially the top in terms of how much poverty we have. Uh, and the reason for this is, and this isn't really contested, all of these other countries have massively uh, uh, larger and more generous welfare states than the U.S. does. So we have a situation where before we factor in poverty, the United States has sort of low poverty rate compared to other countries. But after we take into account welfare, it has the highest. And that's because these other countries' welfare systems decrease their poverty rate to an extent that ours doesn't because they have more welfare. So sort of you're on Brooks's claim here that the best way to get rid of poverty is just through free market capitalism is empirically incorrect. We can see that countries better fight poverty when they have more welfare. Um, and sort of the final data point here, um, this isn't just raw data now. This is an actual study on the issue or an analysis of various studies on the issue. Um, this study is titled uh, The Welfare State and Anti-Poverty Policy in Rich Countries. Uh, and it's essentially sort of trying to establish and analyze the relationship between uh, welfare programs and levels of relative poverty in rich OECD countries. Um, and the study writes here, Several studies have established a strong empirical relationship at country level between the overall level of social spending and various measures of inequality and inequality reduction, including relative poverty. This is arguably one of the more robust findings of comparative poverty research over the past decades, um, and then lists several studies um, which essentially corroborate this correlation. Notable in these analyses is that no advanced economy achieved a low level of income uh, inequality or just inequality and or relative income poverty with a low level of social spending, regardless of how well that country performed on other dimensions that matter for poverty, notably employment. Vice versa, countries with relatively high social spending tended to have lower inequality and poverty. Here, the extent of cross-country variation was always more significant, with some countries achieving more limited inequality uh, poverty reductions despite high social spending. So, not only is it a fact based on the countless studies uh, cited by this uh, analysis that higher levels of social spending in OECD countries have been shown uh, to reduce relative poverty, um, and this is finding is unanimous. But additionally, there was no advanced economy that was able to achieve low levels of relative poverty with low levels of social spending. So... The essential point here is that if we want to do away with poverty, because currently there's a lot of people in poverty, a lot of people suffering because of poverty, and it's a big issue that we should be talking about. And if you want to get rid of poverty, um, which is essentially a problem caused by people not having money, the solution is to give people money. It is literally that simple if people don't have money and they're in poverty give them money and that's how you do away with poverty it is that straightforward and if anybody tries to make any sort of convoluted ahistorical arguments that it isn't that it's more complicated than that than that that it's not that simple um like what you're brooks is doing here um they are simply lying to you because this is um, just historical and empirical fact.